on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. We're really keen to work with authors that are willing to kind of collaborate with us, to, to be hands-on with the recording, to do those extra interviews and things. It's all really, really kind of key to, to helping promote their product because audio is a very different beast from e-books. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show on a Friday with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, first thing I should say, Mark, for people watching in glorious Technicolor is I am proudly wearing a Ukrainian Air Force polo yes, shirt. I know, I know you have one as well. I do. Um, and this has been sent to us by Anton Ein, uh, who is our friend who's been on the podcast before, writer in Ukraine. Uh, last time we spoke to him, I think he'd moved to the city of Lviv. He may even have moved back to Kiev. I'm not sure. He has. I yeah, think, he okay. has. Uh, since then, which is sort of a good sign, but as we all know, following the news, that's not uh, coming to a conclusion anytime soon. Um, but Anton sent me, he knows I'm a bit of an aviation geek, so this means quite a lot to me. He sent me this fantastic uh, top, and they're producing quite a lot of merchandise. In fact, I love that, that they're merchandising the war because they need all the resources they can get hold of. They're up against a superpower, of course, albeit a wilted one. Well, that's a debate. Yeah. Yes, yeah, a wilting superpower. Uh, anyway, thank you, Anton. It's fantastic. Uh, the SU-27 flanker, which is the aerobatic team, I think they use them. And uh, we also got some stamps, which could turn out to be very rare. So they're going to go in my vault with my Star Wars comic. A couple of other things <laughs> <laughs> that I've got in the attic. Uh, thank you, Anton. And uh, this morning, we um, we also had some dialogue in the background with a writer in Ukraine. And uh, we always do what we can, obviously, as a community. I know people are still doing that. But we mustn't let it drift from our thoughts and become... Uh, routine. It's not routine for anybody living in that country at the moment. And uh, there will continue to be initiatives that we will support from time to time on that front. Okay, uh, Mark, we should talk about Ads for Authors because the Ads for Authors course is open at least for another week or so, a week and a bit, I think. Yeah, that's right. So it opened uh, as we record this uh, a few days ago. So it's going out a little bit later. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the, the course is there and um, it's, uh, you know, we've spoken about lots before, but very extensive, lots of um, 50 hours worth of content across all the main advertising platforms, including organic advertising with things like TikTok. So organic, i.e. you don't have to spend anything to, to do it, just invest time. Um, and we've seen lots of success um, with authors doing well with with TikTok, but also, um, you know, Facebook ads. I, I see, you know, I'm still using them quite extensively. Still see a lot of people um, in the community who are concerned about the iOS changes that came in about six months ago. Um, and it, we should probably we should probably do a bit more. Not today, but an, another day we'll do something in a bit more depth on on that. Um, but it's um, it's overplayed uh, in terms of how it affects us because it doesn't really affect. The, the closed garden that Facebook has that we tend to advertise within, it, it does affect if you're tracking traffic off Facebook, but most of the time authors wouldn't be interested or, or wouldn't absolutely necessarily have to do that. So it affects the Facebook pixel a little bit, but it doesn't affect things like interest targeting, custom audiences, lookalikes, or all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I certainly haven't seen any kind of um, degradation in the effectiveness of Facebook ads and and I know we haven't really with with the, the campaigns we run for Fuse either so I wouldn't worry about that um, Amazon ads uh, Janet is uh, engaged in a fairly large reorganization of that at the moment so that's that will be coming quite soon we're going to break it down into beginner intermediate and advanced I think which will make it a little bit easier it's, it's quite a large course um, and yeah, other stuff we'll we, we'll add some some more content in as as we think is relevant, um, and we keep everything up to date as well. So we've uh, we did a quick review of the Facebook course before we uh, opened the cart this week to make sure that everything was was uh, current, and where we felt that it wasn't, we re-recorded sessions and, and slotted those in. So everything should be as you see it on your screen. Yes, yeah, we did some re-recording even very recently, actually, in the last few days. Um, so you'll see some of the screens that you see when you're going through the course will have August 22 on them, couldn't, could not be fresher. Um, I honestly do, do think that does differentiate us from quite a few online courses of the type that I take from time to time, like YouTube instructions and stuff, um, which are out of date. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I think the Facebook thing, it's human nature, isn't it, when changes happen, to think doom and gloom. I get sent stuff, uh, people saying, uh-oh, that's TikTok over, and they send me some article that someone's written about 
TikTok being banned in the world and stuff. And, and everyone, it's human nature perhaps to look on the big side, but the way we should look at changes to Facebook, and there have been challenges, no question about it. There have been targeting issues. Target, some targets have been taken away that I really liked. It was useful to me. And there's periods of the year when big business gets involved in av their heavy advertising and it's, it's harder. You should look at it and think, well, the more I know, the more skilled I am at this, the higher my chances are of, of beating the system. And those people who are doom and gloom and drop away, that actually narrows the field for you, we, dilutes the field for you, makes it better. I don't know what that word is I'm looking for. Um, and at the moment- Reduces competition. Yes, there you go. At the moment, I think it's really good. I think at the moment, I'm getting great results on views, great results on my personal account. I think July and August are kind of slower times. That's probably more influential than those changes you talk about in iOS or targeting is, is big business. So December running up to Christmas or November, I think that would be tougher. But that's why you need to be skilled up, tooled up. And it will change. You know, there's going to be stuff next year that you and I can't even predict at the moment. There will be hurdles put in our way. And that's why we're here um, talking about things every week in a fluid and dynamic way. Absolutely. Yes. Right. We have an announcement to make, don't we? Because we are going to announce today the dates for the self-publishing show live 2023. Uh, we've held two of these, the first in 2020, just under the uh, wire before the pandemic changed the world. And then we had our post-pandemic show uh, a couple of months ago in June in London, which was fantastic and very well attended. And we are going to do it again. Third year, we want this to be, uh, again, the biggest indie gathering in Europe. Uh, we will have people from around the world visiting as we did in June and you can be there. We're going to announce details of the tickets in September. We are doing a kind of loyalty program so people who came this year will get first dibs. Uh, after that it'll go on to general sale. So more details about that probably next month but if you want to put the dates in your diary they are June the 20th which is a Tuesday and Wednesday the 21st, which is a Wednesday of June, both of June, obviously, consecutive days. Easier way of saying that, Mark, is the 20th and 21st of June next year. Exactly, yes. Yeah, oh, it's looking at this in our diary already, so we're all, we're all good to go, yes. So 20th and 21st. Uh, anyway, hopefully we had lovely weather this time. Um, actually, we've had a very nice summer, haven't we? Yeah. Extremely nice, very right. warm. Um, but um yeah ho hopefully it'll be similar weather next year and we'll have uh, have a lot of fun again it was it was good i got some good ideas we got some really good feedback from um we had little kind of suggestions box and we, we must have had three or four hundred of, the, uh, of those stuffed into the box and we've reviewed those some people made the same suggestion maybe 30 or 40 people made one in particular that we'll definitely do with regards to making it easier for you to find other writers within your genre um and uh, some other suggestions on speakers and uh, bits and bobs that we think we can we can implement to improve things even further. So we're looking forward to getting into that. Um, we'll probably start planning that in, in the, at the start of next year, but um, definitely we'll, we'll have the tickets on sale in September. Yes, and uh, yeah, a few, few uh, decisions we've got to make about how we do the tickets and so on, but um, it'll be more or less the same structure of the event two days of conference and we'll have a party on the tuesday night the first night at the south bank center so yeah we're just by the time this goes out we will have signed the contract but we have finished the negotiation phase of that uh, unfortunately everything is going up in the world at the moment so we're we're going to have to think about how we uh we structure the the payments we just about broke even in fact i'm not 100 percent we've broken even yet because we've still got a few bills to pay but uh, we won't be far away from breaking even uh, this time we don't want to make a massive loss on it but the prices have gone up for higher this is a behind the scenes chat but sort of thing craig talks about very openly as well when he talks about 20 books conferences so we should as well um, and i suspect a few of the other costs are going to go up um so some thoughts you and i will have to have about this over a beer between now and september maybe on the beach in September because if you want to come and say hello to us in person uh, and I was going to say buy us a beer but actually we'll buy you a beer you can do that because uh, we're going to be in the US in Florida in September we'll be attending Link but you don't have to be attending the conference to come and say hello to us because we're going to be holding an open drinks uh, on the evening of let me just get this in front of me Mark we're flying out on the night of the evening of the 23rd of September it's a Friday. It's a Friday night. So there you go. No excuses. The weekend starts there. And it starts at the Shark Tooth Tavern, uh, which you will find uh, as part of the, what is that place called? Trade Winds. 
the Trade Winds Trade Resort, Winds yeah, in St. Yeah. Pete's Beach. So if you go to the Trade Winds Hotel in St. Pete Beach, on their estate there is the Shark Tooth Tavern just off the beach. You can walk along the beach to it. And uh, we will be in there drinking cold beer. It's going to start at 9 o'clock to deconflict with some other things. Uh, and at the sessions itself, if you are attending the conference, um, I'll be doing a talk on TikTok. Uh, I'm also actually, they've asked me to moderate a panel, uh, which I'm going to do on a Thursday night. Uh, and we are going to record an episode of the self-publishing show live on the main stage, which I'm really looking forward to. I say I'm looking forward to it. I always have to plan it, which is you do. reasonable. Yeah. Epic. Uh, small outside broadcast production. We'll get a big, uh, yes. get a couple of trailers for you and me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Green and, a, and a Fiat 126 for, <laughs> for John to sin. Hey, John, and, John and Tom can share it. <laughs> yeah, and, they, uh, <laughs> and they relax. Um, good. Okay, look, I think we've got all our announcements out of the way. So we are talking audiobooks today. Um, I need to make a decision about when I'm going to do and how I'm going to do my next audiobook. I'll ask you about that at the end of the interview because I do have a, a decision to make on that, which I'm mulling at the moment. But audiobooks are a hugely vibrant, growing part of our, our industry. Uh, I don't... any. I rarely do direct advertising for my audio book and I sell one or two a day, uh, which is fantastic. So at the end of the month, it's often the difference between my Facebook campaigns on one book, making a loss and making a profit, um, which is brilliant. So audio books, definitely something you should be getting into. And one of the oldest players in the market is WF Howells. And you may not even have heard of them, but they were around in the old days of C60 cassettes and DVDs and, and CDs in libraries and so on. They have been doing audiobooks before we knew the, the phrase audiobook. Uh, they're part of a bigger company now, but they are the largest independent audiobook producer uh, certainly in the UK, possibly in the world. And uh, we're going to hear all about their methodology and how they are building a relationship with the indie community uh, through their uh, spokesman, who is Craig Thompson. And then Mark and I will be back for a chat. This is the Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Craig Thompson, welcome to the Self-Publishing Show. Lovely to have you on here. We're going to be talking audio books and we're going to be talking a company called WF House. So I think, Craig... A good place to start would be with who WF Howes are, and then we can talk a bit about who you are. No worries at all, James. Thank you for inviting me on, I should say, that's the first thing. Yeah, so um, we're the UK's largest audiobook, um, sorry, largest independent audiobook publisher, and, and we're really part of the um, RB Media Group. Um, I mean, we've really established ourselves as, as kind of the specialists in audio. We've been doing this for over 20 years, really working in this particular market. Um, I mean, we start, we started with, you know, cassettes and, um, and CDs, those kind of originals. And, and, and we've since kind of evolved with the industry as the industry's kind of moved into other things like Audible, you know, and, and that kind of subscription based model. We've evolved with it. So we've been there since the start. And um, yeah, I think that's really kind of held us in, in really good stead. I mean, we work exclusively in audio. So we have we have no kind of um, no print. Found, no founding in print at all. It's all audio based. Our marketing is all specific to audio. The way we produce is all audio specific. So that's really our kind of main focus. And as I said, that's kind of established us as these kind of um, audio specialists. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, that's where we've been. And we've kind of been pioneers in this field. So, um, yeah. you know, moving into originals recently. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fascinating kind of change in the industry over the past few years, and since I started um, a couple of years ago, and it's it's really exciting, you know, to be part of it. I'm sure everybody's got lots of questions on audio, and it's one of those things that everybody seems to be talking about, particularly in the publishing industry. Yeah, it's definitely dynamic at the moment. I can tell you from my own experience this year, the audiobook sales, it, it seems to be the one area I don't have to market too hard. They just seem to, seem to sell themselves, which is great. Uh, yeah, there's an appetite yeah. and there's a growing market. But 20-odd 20, 20 years, I mean, you see, started in in DV or CDs, I guess, and, and cassettes. I mean, I know you weren't there then, but that was... That was sort of pioneering at that point. There can't be yeah. too many options for uh, for audiobook producers. No, and it, and it was primarily like that, that the real kind of demand for that kind of stuff was in libraries and things. I mean, and we still get it now. We still get a lot, particularly here in the UK, we get a lot of um, libraries that still want that physical product. We still produce CDs. Wow. Um, but, you know, I think particularly that market are very interested in. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's one that's still, it's still kind of, it's not been outmoded yet. It's still there. But obviously the, the, the change and the growth 
in the market has come from retail really that's largely where it's been yeah and i, I suppose that's early though. i was trying to think back i can remember those those cassettes being in there but i think they were marketed more or less as like books for the blind in the very early days yeah. you'd listen to it but actually that's silly for us to think that that everybody wouldn't quite like to sit down and listen on a pair of headphones to a book and it's become such a huge thing now not um not just for people who are visually impaired um but i guess the digitization was the unlocking of the you know the portability of an audio book was the unlocking yeah. of it for the retail market yeah and i think as well i mean very very recently we've had a lot of changes obviously with the pandemic and the way things you know the, the market has changed slightly again um there was a lot of people, particularly, you know, probably, I think the majority of people were using it kind of for commuting. If you look at kind of Nielsen data and, and things like that, the majority of audiobook publishers um, prior to the pandemic, in, in, sorry, publishers, sorry, the majority of audiobook consumers prior to the pandemic were, you know, largely using it as a kind of commuting kind of um, media. They were using it, you know, when they're traveling to work on the tube in that, that kind of, in, you know, that kind of environment. And I think as well, like with the pandemic, there was a lot of that, that kind of change. There was obviously a worry, I think, that, that people, there might be a drop off, but obviously not because there was a lot of people who were very curious during the pandemic um, about audio and, and um, first time listenership actually rose during that time. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it was a very interesting how the market changed, how people listen to audio or, or why people listen to audio books. Um, yeah, it just makes for a really interesting kind of kind of um, environment, really. I should say, and how how the how the consumership's changed as well. Are you concerned about the dropping away of commuting, which is uh, one of those consequences of the pandemic? Well, that that was as I, I said, that was a slight concern, but it's proved not to really have been one, to be honest, because of the amount of people that have become that, that have kind of transferred to audio. Really, I think that we, as I said, there was a massive boom during the pandemic. People. I think curious more than anything about audio, um, you know, certain, uh, I think there were certain retailers that were really pushing it. Um, so I think we, we, that, that's not really been so much of a problem. Um, and the growth has been really, really encouraging. Um, so no, we've not really had that kind of problem, I don't think. And I think people will continue to listen to it in those things. A lot of people are using it for relaxation. So listening at home for leisure. Um, and that kind of stuff, which is really quite, that's really interesting to hear. I know a lot of people, for instance, that do it during their hobby times, for instance, yeah. and things like that. So it's um, it's really great. I mean, like when people are cooking, there's a lot of people still listen to audio books for that. Um, so it's a really, really interesting kind of how that kind of, how people are using audio. That's really interesting how that's changed. Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, I don't do it downstairs when cooking because my house is chaotic and busy and two teenagers uh, and I wouldn't be able to do it but I actually do do it relaxation lie on the bed yeah. I've just listened I just finished Steve Coogan's um, also biography as a comedian here in the UK actor mm-hmm. I did a Richard Iowardi book before that so I sort of choose this kind of non-fiction comedian stuff and it's really is genuinely a relaxing time because you're lying yeah. on the bed nothing else to do you get transported off a little bit and I can imagine during lockdown that was something people discovered yeah, and I think that's kind of testament to what, to particularly some of the genres that are doing very, very well in the audio world. So, um, I mean, I've seen, I think there was that escapism needed during lockdown, particularly with the news and all of everything that was, that was kind of happening. Um, and particularly, I mean, audio has always seen um, a growth in, in particularly the, the genre fiction, so science fiction, um, horror, or all those kind of... Um, not speculative, but, you know, um, kind of high concept genres have always kind of um, had, a, had a market here in audio. Um, but here we, we did see a massive growth in those. And I've seen a growth actually um, in things like historical fiction as well. Crime and thrillers always have their place, but I think there has been a kind of movement towards these kind of more, you know, fantasy based genres that really do offer people an escape. And I think that's been really interesting that, people do that kind of like you said to kind of move away and and almost escape what's happening what's happening in the world as it were yeah yeah much needed does wf house specialize in a particular genres um no no we don't um we're kind of all, all round really um yeah we we cover most of you know the key genres the big ones always you know are 
crime and thriller romance you know we do that and i mean one of my bread and butters is always um kind of crime and detective um fiction really so that that's always done really well like you know crime series always do incredibly well for us um but yeah we, we also do a lot of science fiction recently and fantasy we're, we're publishing an author um, v schwab who's absolutely brilliant writes these really really great fantasy stories um and, and that's kind of been a real success for us as of late um, but also non-fiction we do a lot of non-fiction and that's an area that has really grown since i've been with the company in terms of audio really really exciting in that part um, and we also have our own kids imprint nudged which um there's a lot of children so yeah we cover a, a whole range of different subjects um you know across you know all, all different types of genres really yeah and I know the question everyone's going to be asking, listening to this now, is how do you acquire authors, bearing in mind there's lots of authors listening to this? Yeah, so, um, well, I suppose what I should say is really what my role. So I, I work as a senior acquisitions editor for Quest, which is um, WF House, its own specialist imprint, and it deals with digital bestsellers. So I, I'm really interested and excited by seeing what's going, what's selling well in the ebook format. That is really what my main focus is. Um, and I say we've been running probably for around about five years now. We've had some real, real success um, with what we do here with this imprint. Um, what I, you know, what I'm looking at with authors and how I acquire, I'm, I'm really interested in a number of different things. I'm, I'm really interested in working with authors that are incredibly entrepreneurial. So I'm, I'm looking at kind of the reviews, that how they kind of um, work in terms of. Um, engaging with their audience. I'm really, really excited to see when I see authors doing that. They have that, and, and, and also to have websites like front facing things, you know, ways of kind of engaging again with their audience in that way, having that kind of um, background there. Um, and, you know, of, obviously this is all alongside really well packaged books, you know, that's really key. Cover blurbs being really kind of spot on with all that kind of stuff. That's all key to how I look at, you know, and, and how I assess authors and, and that books and i think another thing really for us is is that that willingness to collaborate um, we see ourselves as kind of a, an author's audio arm and we're really really keen to kind of work that as i said we don't really have the, the, the we don't have the print rights to fall back on so all, ours is completely audio based and that's another thing we're really keen to work with authors that are willing to kind of collaborate with us to, to be hands-on with the recording to, um, you know, um, and, and, and think of other things like, you know, bonus material to do those extra interviews and things. That's all really, really kind of key to, 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 to kind of, to kind of helping promote their product because audio is a very different beast from eBooks. And um, we find that those things, if we can get those things right, we have a really kind of great um, recipe for kind of um, success, particularly with authors. And do you wait for authors to submit to you or do you trawl the charts and pick out people you think are, are likely candidates? Well, yeah, um, a, a bit of everything, really. I work, um, yes, I work with a lot, a, a lot of self-pubbed authors, many who, you know, have come to me um, with, with inquiries. Um, I do a lot of kind of my own as well. When I, you know, find authors that I think are you know, suitable, I'll, I'll, you know, begin a kind of, kind of conversation with them. Um, but I do a lot as well with all, um, agents as well. I work with a lot of agents um, and also with publishers as well. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of work across a, a wide variety of different kind of acquisition models. But, um, yeah, I work um, – it's, it's kind of a mixture, really, how I buy it. Um, and I'm always willing to kind of have an, you know, have an email come in and always excited to have a look and see what different ebooks are available, really. Yeah. And you say you, you like to work with, or you get excited by working with entrepreneurial authors, but I guess from a, a self-published entrepreneurial author will also be examining other routes, i.e. the self-published route, which is, I have to say, the route I've gone down with my first novel. I, I've paid in advance. Yep. I've paid for the production to be done by Matt Addis here in the UK. And I upload that myself. So I'm on a full royalty yep. uh, in, at the moment, exclusive with Audible, but not necessarily forever. It's difficult. Do you find that entrepreneurial self-published author who at the same time is happy to sign a deal with you? And and obviously, because that's how it works, sign away some of that royalty. Yeah, I mean, um, working with authors in, in that sense, it's obviously they're very, very hands on. They're very keen to kind of exploit their audio rights in the best way possible. And again, that's all to be lauded, really. 
Um, I suppose what we kind of offer that is different is, you know, we can order, we can offer the kind of good quality specialist production that um, other audio, you know, audio producers perhaps don't necessarily have the same level that we do because of how kind of specialist we are really on with regards to that. So I suppose that's the key thing. I suppose one one of the hardest things about um, the audio market is the cost of recording, um, and the costs can be very very high. Um, it's very easy to lose money. And I think certain publishers themselves are, are learning that as well. Um, so the may, you know, in terms of the way we come in is we take that, we kind of ease that burden a little bit in that we pay for the entire recording. We do it. We, we kind of make sure it's all um, fully produced and, and done in a kind of way that's, that's just of the highest quality possible. And then on top of that, we also do kind of the distribution. And I think that's probably another key thing. You mentioned kind of being exclusive to Audible. We have one of the largest, if not the largest, um, distribution network um, in this industry. Um, we've got um, you know, links to not just Audible, but all the other places as well that are kind of emerging players, say just, just kind of larger players like Apple, Google, Kobo, um, Storytel, all these different places where we're able to kind of and put those right. So we're offering the kind of greatest um, exposure available. And we also have links into libraries as well, which I think can be very, very, um, in, you know, particularly lu lucrative for authors um, when they're trying to kind of build that audience. That's one of the things we also do as well. So it's, it, we're able to offer that um, um, kind of increased exposure, but also, um, as I say, pay for that recording, get that recording of distribute it accordingly and also make sure it's incredibly high quality as well yeah so that's kind of what separates us from other places i think and that's kind of why i would encourage you know people coming to us because you know we can be that audio arm for them and really help them you say you have a wide distribution network does that mean that you don't ever put your books exclusive with audible you're always wide no, no we're always wide with all that kind of stuff yeah yeah that's yeah. kind of one of our key things and do you have do you at the moment or have plans to operate as an aggregator, maybe for self published authors and a bit like Draft Digital is with the ebooks, um, uh, uh, distribute on their behalf and take a small you know small percentage? Um, I don't yeah I don't know no not at the moment from my understanding no. Sounds if you've got a big distribution network that might be a, a future development plan you can yeah. you can have that one for free Craig that uh, <laughs> that business development idea. Um, Okay, a couple of questions then. So you talk about, uh, you know, the upfront cost, absolutely, and I know that, and I can't remember the top of my head, but probably best part of £3,000, I think. So $4,000. Yeah. Uh, it can be, yeah, it's usually around about that, depending, yeah. depending on where. Um, and I have to say, whilst you're, you're absolutely appropriate to say that, you know, the quality is something you guarantee. I had a fantastic experience with, with Matt Addis and his production company, which I think was called something like Liquid. I, I won't guess it because everyone is company yeah, name. it's not to say that yeah, i should clarify not yeah. to say that they wouldn't be a poor quality no, he, in places, his was super he, he employs a, brilliant. a producer and an editor and every stage went backwards and forwards on on accents and and and, and everything it was a really good good process yeah i mean that's key isn't it that that is key to have that really i would say when you're producing audio is to have that collaboration really yeah and um, it's exactly what we were talking about earlier it's making sure that you've got that high quality um, audio kind of experience um, there as well. I think that is really key. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, no, that all sounds. It was a good experience for me, but wasn't cheap and uh, haven't paid it off yet. But uh, you know, getting there uh, after a few months. Um, but you to to make that work for you, do you have an entirely in-house team to employ your own narrators and engineers, producers, and so on? Yep. So we have our own in-house studio. I'm in one of the booths now. Um, moment. Yeah, and we have a network of studios all around the country as well from other kind of places um, so that we've got basically the opportunity for authors, particularly when we have higher profile narrators, um, actors, for instance, they have access to, you know, studios there where they're based as well. So, yeah, we've got a really high. That was one of the positives, of, you know, of, of our experiences. We already kind of have that set in place. But, yeah, we have our own in-house studio, all the kind of editors as well. and and our own studio team who, who deal with casting and everything really. Um, but so do you employ narrators yourself or do you generally use freelance? Or? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we would employ them. Um, most, most we've got a really, really kind of strong pool of narrators 
um, many of which are kind of an experience from all sorts of different kind of walks of life, different kind of studios as well. So yeah, we have a great pool of narrators that we use. Um, obviously, a lot of these narrators have their own kind of audiences as well. You know, people like um, Jonathan Keeble are really, really well known in the audiobook world and have big kind of following themselves now. So yeah, people like that that we, that we kind of work with. How much is it worth having a bigger name as a narrator? Does it make a big difference to the sales? <laughs> we always joke, if it's Stephen Fry, you're guaranteed a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it depends on the book, to be quite honest. Yeah, um, I think key to it really, the whole thing is making sure that the narrator fits the audio book first and foremost to make sure that the, the narrator delivers that content in a way that, that works for the author and is kind of reflective of the tone and the content of the book. I think that's first of all. Um, there are cases when I think kind of bigger names are, are really useful. I think sometimes with larger profile books, they can be a really great, particularly if something's being adapted um, into a television show, for instance. But I do think, yeah, that... It, it, it really does vary depending on what, what book is being produced at the time, really, I would say. Yeah. Now you I mean, we do sorry. have the Richard Armitage effect, which I was just... The Richard Armitage effect? Yeah. Yeah. Richard Armitage does very, very well when he oh, does, whenever he's using... You see him all over, you know, does some great books with Audible and um, uh, does some great books with us as well. David Hewson's book, Richard Armitage has done for us, have been absolutely um, spectacular. Um, and he's also done a couple of our LJ Ross books, which are really, really great as well. Sure. So yeah, would always um, yeah recommend that. Yeah, as you say, they have their own audience, a good narrator, don't they? So yeah. um, now you mentioned bonus material, um, which I think is something someone mentioned to me before, and I'd forgotten about as, about it as an idea. But it's exactly the sort of thing that I could add to the end of my audio book. I could easily, you know, because I obviously used to doing interviews. I like an interview with me about the book, about the writing process. Is that the sort of thing that's worth doing and adding to the end of your, your audio book? Yeah, I think it goes back to that kind of entrepreneurial spirit that I was kind of alluding to. And if you've got any way of kind of engaging with your audience, I would always kind of advocate for that. So we do um, a couple of my books uh, particularly on my imprint, we've done a lot of great kind of Q and A's. Um, we've actually done one very recently um, with the author Morgan Green, um, who wrote Angel Maker and the Jane Johansson series with with the narrator. And it's really great because you have this moment where you have the author and the narrator both kind of speaking, but they're both coming at it from different perspectives, um, and it makes for a really really fascinating kind of listen as well. So I would, always guarantee, um, I would always kind of push for things like that. If you can get those Q&As um, in as, as kind of bonus material, fans love that because they can just, they feel like they've got that kind of closer engagement with an author and with, um, kind of, with the series itself. They get more, almost like they've got that, that further investment with it. So yeah, I, I would always recommend that. Um, but yeah, we've done a lot of kind of those, those kind of Q&As, um, particularly when we're working, say, with, um, so like a celebrity author or somebody with a higher following will sometimes get them as well to do um, intros if they're not fully involved in the full narration of the book. So we'll always kind of look for that. Um, and we're also kind of big on um, enhancements as well. So whether that be kind of sound effects or, or other elements, we can do that as well. Music sometimes has been involved. Um, yeah, we, we recently, um, one of my colleagues did a, um, a, a book um, recently with David Gilmore, which um, from Pink Floyd, mm. who um, right up my street, yeah, yeah, who actually created some original music for the book, which was absolutely fantastic. So yeah, we can um, we can do that, and we you know we we I say any opportunity we can for anything like that is really really kind of right up our street really for that. That could be my next bedtime uh, listening listening bit of uh, DG. Um, the uh, you just mentioned there about sound effects and stuff. Obviously, David Gilmour lends itself to a bit of music, but there is this whole transition, this, this movement from the plain audio book. At the other end of the scale, you've basically got what we'd call a radio play with multiple actors yep. and a cast and produced with sound effects. And somewhere in between is is something that I'm hearing a little bit more often on audio books. It's just a bit of background and um, maybe one other voice. Is, is this something you're exploring at the moment? 
Yeah, so we, as I mentioned, we've done some, we call them enhancements, really, enhanced audio. It seems to be a thing that, that is, it's still very, quite popular. I think, again, it's one of those ones where you've got to be, it has to be reflective of the material and it's not to be used everywhere um, because I think it can, pretend, there is the potential sometimes, particularly if the sound effects aren't quite um, synced in, that it, it, it can potentially cause problems with the experience, but, you know, the listening experience, sorry, I should say. However, there are times when it can really, really increase and, and make an audio book, you know, sound something better. We recently, um, I think uh, probably about two years ago, did a series. Um, the first book was called Holt House. It's part of the Eden and Book Society um, series um, by Dead Ink Books. Um, and we created these kind of, the, the Eden Book Society are kind of like retro horror stories. And we wanted to kind of enhance the audio and make it seem in keeping with this idea of retro kind of 1970s horror. So we added this effect to the story, which made it sound like it was an old tape recording, you know, like crackle, make it sound kind of like old. And we, and we were able to add the story to that, of saying that these were the um, early cassette recordings of the Eden Book Society stories that have actually just been recovered for the very first time. Brilliant. Um, and it, it made for a great story and, um, and, it, and also really, really helped the recording, Alt House and places like that. And, you know, that's the kind of when, when that kind of enhanced audio can come up that long and sound incredibly well, um, incredibly good. And we've, we've also done a, a recent book, um, an original, um, where we've got binaural sound. So the idea being that um, you can, it's almost like surround sound and that, you know, it's like, say a bee is flying past you. You can hear the bee kind of get louder as it comes past you and things like that, which has been really, really exciting as well. Mm. And what about music? A bit of library music, maybe make sure obviously it's copyright uh, uh, <laughs> done, but would that, um, is that something that could enhance the sound just to bring the chapter to an end? Yeah, that, that's what I would normally suggest that, that music, if, if it is used, is, is used in that, say, almost as an intro to the, um, to the story. Um, maybe if the book is split into different parts, so first part two, you know, part two, part three, you, you can really kind of create that bridge between each, each part by using music to you know, kind of have an intro and have an outro as well. Sometimes if it's used every chapter, I think sometimes it could get a bit kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, the reader might not be too keen on that. Sorry, the listener, I should say in this case. But um, I think in, in parts, yeah, I think I think it works really, really well. Hmm. My mind is turning over with uh, possibilities here. <laughs> um, let's talk about deals. Now, I know, obviously, like any publishing company, deals are author-specific and confidential, but can you give us an idea that if an author signed with you, what sort of they, they could be expecting to weigh up against other uh, avenues they might consider? Yeah, so um, obviously you can't go into kind of, uh, you, know, you know, anything in terms of advances. We normally offer um, kind of, kind of a, a decent solid, solid advance. Um, we do offer um, zero royalties as well. There is that option with, a, you know, like obviously a, then- Like it, a buyout? We can do, no, we wouldn't offer, no, we don't necessarily offer that. that. So what's what do you mean by zero royalties? So you would get, you know, we would just sign the rights over, but then what you would get on top of that is basically you'd be earning straight from the start. I think that's the key thing for us is that we're able to kind of do all the legwork and make sure that authors are offering kind of, they're, they're, they're earning straight away. That's the key thing, whether it be via an advance or just via the royalty. So it'd be royalty only in that, in that case. So that's probably the best way of describing it, James, for you. So okay. we offer the two models there. Normally, I should say um, the advance is the way that we go. It's very rare that we do the other one um, recently from, from experience, but it has been the advanced one. And then on top of that, as I mentioned, we would cover all of the recording costs all of the kind of marketing costs in that sense, we do all that as well. Yeah. So someone in my position is upfronted the cost of it. I, if you offered me an advance, I basically have to add in the other three thousand pounds and my time and all that effort as well to consider, you know, the kind of deal that's that's on the of table. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then a percentage, hopefully, if the uh, if the advance <laughs> well, earns well, out. I, I should say, yeah, there would be royalties included on that as well. You know, you've got all your royalties as well on top of your advance as well so you know there's all that it's just we offer the two different models sometimes 
it all depends on the book as well and what the author, you know, we're, we're quite keen to negotiate as well. Yeah. So we talk with authors, we make, you know, we, we kind of get an idea about what they want. Um, and, and we're always keen to discuss with authors as well what they're looking for. And we like to be, and we make sure, you know, as I say, we're author centric here. So it's all about what the authors expect. And we, we want to be fair to authors. It's all keen. But, you know, we're all about kind of monetizing audio rights for authors and making sure that they're getting the best deal possible. Yeah. So, yeah, we have all these different models available. And it's, it's more just about kind of discussion with the author and kind of what, what, what fits their, their expectations. But as I said, on top of all of that, you would also get the cost of the recording, which would be completely covered by us. Yeah, definitely the right right way to work. That's how we work with uh, with authors as well, and our, our little Fuse Enterprise. Um, yeah. It's got to work for both of you, otherwise there's no point in doing it. Yeah, th- that's exactly it when I talk about collaboration. We're all about working with authors, making sure they're getting the best deals possible. Um, that, that for us is key, really key. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the length of contracts, does that vary, or do you have a, do a fixed time um, you offer? Yeah, um, so our standard is normally, it really just depends that one. Yeah, um, okay. we, we normally have a, a, a kind of a range of different I know ones. Again, s- seven years is, is talked a lot about in the industry, isn't it? Is that enough yeah, time do, for you to, because the investment in your case is a little bit different from other publishers? Yeah, so we, yeah, we do, as I say, a range of different ones. Okay. We've done seven, we've done 10 years before. Um, we, yeah, it, it's a range of different kind of terms on our, on our contracts. All again negotiable with the author, depending on what it is. Yeah, yeah what, what the book is. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of the company going okay, I guess it's been, you enjoyed the last couple of years, I, I suspect. Yeah, as I said, it, it's a booming area, really, with a d- double digit growth in, in the, the, the overall market. We've, um, you know, kind of grown as a, as a company. My imprint, um, last I checked, you know, had, had tripled. Um, in terms of that, you know growth as well, so it, it's an absolutely fascinating and, and brilliant, and really exciting time to be in audio um, and to be working with you know a, a, a range of different authors. There's lots of exciting products coming out as well. Authors are really keen to kind of offer different um, different books, different kind of experiences for listeners, and that's really great as well. So that's been really encouraging for us. Um, I, you know it. It is in a very competitive field, though. That, I mean, that's one of the things I would say is that, you know, as much as it is growing, um, it, it's still slightly smaller than the ebook market. So it's still sometimes quite difficult to, to find an audience. But, um, you know, it, it, it's one that I think that's why it's kind of imperative to have, to have an audio specialist with you in your corner to kind of open, you know, the doors to some of these retailers. A lot of them have kind of, um, kind of, they're almost like walled gardens. It's quite difficult to get into, say, promotions and merchandise. So, you know, to have somebody like us involved to help and can, can really kind of push that a little bit. There's a spider's attached itself to me, so I'm slightly distracted. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, you probably noticed it. We don't have this issue no. here, I should say. No, yeah. I need a spider free. Um, well, that's good for the flies. Um, okay, <laughs> so in terms of geography, you're obviously based in the UK. Whereabouts are you actually? We're actually based in the um, East Midlands, so right okay. in the cent- you know, yeah, central part of the um, of the country. Um, we've, you know, there's great routes into London, so we can do all that kind of stuff. But yeah, we're based in the Midlands, which is quite rare, I think, in the publishing um, yeah. publishing world. But yeah, no, um, we're right out in the countryside here in here in Leicestershire. And do you specialise um, in in UK based authors, or are you a global outfit? Doesn't really matter where the author yeah, is. Yeah, so we're part of the RB Media Group. So yeah, we've got this kind of really, really, and this is what goes back to that distribution network. We've got a really, really large. Um, kind of international um, distribution network. We've got all this incredible reach. We've got offices um, in, in America, but also in Australia. And we very recently expanded into Germany as well. So yeah, we've got this kind of brilliant global reach. Um, but yeah, for, for us here at WF House, we, we focus um, on the kind of UK and, and Commonwealth markets really as well. Yeah, that, that's kind of our main focus, but we do have this kind of great reach and we work very closely with our, um, with, with our, you know, our cousins, yeah. <laughs> as it were. And in terms of marketing uh, the books, you've got your distribution network, but what sort of, I mean, do you, you know, I, I run paid ads to my books. Do yeah. you, is that sort of thing you do as well? We do a bit of that. Um, and it's, it's very difficult in the audio um, world because um, it's, it's a very, as I said, it's, a, it's quite a different beast from e-books. 
Um, and we find that a lot of the audiobook retailers, um, Audible and that, they, as I said, it's that kind of wall, it's kind of like a, a walled garden type thing. It's quite, quite difficult to get into there unless you've, you've got those pre-existing relationships. And that's kind of one of the key things for us really has been that because we've been in this for so long, we've got these, we've managed to establish these really great relationships with people like Audible with Storytel, with Apple, Apple, Google, all these different places. And we get, op, you know, we get the kind of um, opportunity to get into various merchandising promotions and then things like that that aren't really available to self-published authors. Um, and that, I suppose that's kind of one of the key things for us really is that. And, and we find that they do, that if you can get onto one of those, it can really, really help sell an audio book. Um, so that's kind of the key marketing. We do... Um, we do often pitch to Audible as well. That's another thing. So we can get books out in front of them um, early beforehand. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very much that. It's, it's, it's a little bit different from, um, you know, as I said, ebook. It's yeah. a different kind of beast. And I think sometimes that um, can be difficult to kind of get your head around. But, yeah, that's, that's kind of the main approaches that we, we take. But we do do a little bit of Facebook um, advertising as well. Yeah. Great. Well, it's been a really fascinating talk to you. I mean, also, I should say that you are, you've are you come on board as one of the sponsors of the self-publishing show live in London, which we're really excited about. I mean, we're recording this just before, the week before the conference, yeah. but it will go out afterwards. So unfortunately, if you're listening to this and think, oh, I'm going to have a chat with Craig, you won't be able to. But are you going to be personally joining us next week, Craig? Yes, I'm delighted to say that I will be. Yeah, we shall have a stand. Um, I will be on hard. I might even have some notebooks for people so they can all come and yeah, wow. take a notebook from us. Um, yeah, I'll be on hand to answer any questions about audio. I say particularly excited to be you know talking to you guys really and to get a, get an idea about what you guys are looking for and and also you know that as I said um, what we can offer for you as well in terms of you know getting getting your audio books out there really. Yeah, great. Any swag you bring will be gone in 5.8 seconds at the beginning of the uh, the first 500 people who turn up. Um, I'll tell my marketing manager yeah. to pack double. <laughs> Brace himself, uh, and I'll be up there as well. Um, really lovely talking to you, Craig. Very excited uh, to see you batting for authors and, and finding a piece of the market that can work for them, and, and particularly the sort of collaborative approach that you have, uh, which I think is so important to be um, to be supported. Uh, those old days of um, of the kind of money machine publisher seeing authors as the as the sort of fodder that came in, I hope are, yeah. are behind us, and that's not how the new world operates. And I'm pleased to hear that's uh, very much yeah. the way you operate. That engagement is uh, uh, just is so so integral, I think, and to have that spirit is, is so great. We find if those authors are engaging with their fans, and, and we're able to kind of you know help help with that as well. It's so key. So yeah, no, I, I completely agree with James. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Craig Thompson, lovely man. He came to the conference as well. And uh, yeah, WF House, big uh, established company. Been doing it for years. Been doing it before you and I even probably had even written a book. Before you'd even oh, written a book. Def Definitely, yeah. No, they've um, been around for ages, and they, they are my publishers. So um, I um, was a—I've done a couple myself through ACX, um, which is is a pretty easy, simple experience and and quite good fun. Uh, I then went directly with Audible Studios, who did maybe fifteen of the Milton books, and then uh, from around about book sixteen onwards, I transitioned over to uh, to um, House in the UK and Tantor in the US, and they're both owned by. A big German conglomerate called RF Media, I think, um, who were in both of those, and they. It was just one of those things for me that it was. I, I'm quite busy, and I don't necessarily have the time to to uh, to produce the audiobooks myself. It's possible that I'm leaving a little bit of money on the table, but I don't really care um, because uh, they they're really easy to work with. They've they're very professional, um, and they're doing a great job selling selling the books that, that we've published together. So I'm, I'm, I think they're great. I've, I've been very impressed with, with both House and Tantor, um, and I'm pleased to be able to, to work with them and continue to. Yeah, Tantor published six of our books in Fuse as well, uh, the audio rights, and um, we have a good relationship with them. Um, so, yeah, I need to get my second book done. I am keen to do it, but it's quite, you know, I'm doing it. I want to do it. So I want to pay for the production, own the tapes, and upload them myself to Audible, uh, and then choose whether I'm going to go exclusive or wide at that point, but have that option to do it. Uh, that's just my choice and preference, but it's a 
top heavy in terms of upfront money so it's about three grand i think uh, last time maybe a little bit more my second book is shorter but it's american set in america so i probably need an american accent and matt addis is fantastic did a great job on book one for me and i haven't asked him yet but maybe he does an american mm. accent you don't you don't need an american narrator i mean remember, remember my books are set all over the world so a lot of the books are set in yeah, set in america so i've had the same narrator david thorpe for all of the milton books so 20 so far um and he he'll narrate his kind of narrator's voice is his own voice so a you know, fairly neutral english voice but he can do any accent he i have not been able to trip him up yet and i have tried but he can do everything um so if there's an american character he will do that character in in a region appropriate um, accent. So we have you know, we've done Deep South, we've done New York, we've done Los Angeles, we've done bits in the middle, Kansas, we've done, and and Dave was able to handle all of those, and, and so well in fact that readers from those places think that he must be from those places too. So that's that's what you need to find. You need to speak to your narrator. I would suggest trying to keep the same one if you can, and you're happy with them, and your readers are happy. Changing narrators, I don't think is a very good idea generally. Um, let's see if he can do if he can do American accents. I think if he can't, um, you might you might want to change. Um, but if he can, um, it's probably a good reason to to stick with him. Hmm. I suppose the difference between yours is a bit like James Bond series and he flies around the world. Yeah, I'd expect that to be narrated by, and he's English. But this this second book is is a standalone book. Both of my books are standalone. It's wholly set in California and Alaska. A spoiler. Um, it's an all American characters. There is, there's no Britishness to it at all. Well, remember, I mean, uh, uh, American listeners have no problem with British sounding narrators. Mm. Um, you know, Stephen Fry sells a lot of books in the US as well as in the UK. Harry so I don't set th- in the UK. Yeah, I don't think that really matters. Uh, I, you know, I think, you know, look at um, the, the, the English or the British accent, the English Queen's English is not something that Americans are going to shy away from. I mean, we, we might get some comments for, in, for the YouTube video for this, but I, I, I suspect it might actually be a positive thing um, that, you know, it's read. You know, Lawrence Olivier didn't do too badly over there, and Kenneth Branagh does quite well. I mean, the, the English actors do very well in America, and they don't necessarily always change their accents. Hugh Grant, for example, you know, we could go on and on and on. And on. Um, I do think if, if you've got American characters, they have to sound American. Mm. Um, so if you can't if you can't do them well enough, then you've got no choice. Um, but I, I would I'd ask him to mm. have a listen, ask him to do some some kind of rehearsals and see 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 what he comes up with. Yeah, yeah, I have to mull that over. I would be interested to hear your opinion um, if you want to post that into the comments or in our Facebook group. Well, let me know what you think, and then I'm going to have to pony up and get that one done. I've already got people waiting for it, so. So I've got at least two sales. Um, <laughs> good. Okay, look, thank you very much indeed to our guest, uh, Craig Thompson from WF Howes. Lovely to speak to you, Craig. And thank you to the team behind, especially... From who? Derek Howes? I said Craig Thompson, didn't I? You said Craig, Craig Thompson from Derek Howes. Oh, did I? Who are Derek Howes? From Who's Derek Howes? WF Howes. My camera's yes. about to melt, so I have to finish off now. Okay. Um, and thank you to the team, uh, especially John, who we do with, but he uh, organises everything behind and makes sure that you actually do get to listen to the show once a week. Where would we be without him? Answers on a postcard. Mm. Um, here we go. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.